Here we go. Well, um, welcome to Richie's Roost, um, Chaco, Mississippi. This is a retake, folks, and a very mm, forgiving person who uh, sat through this one time before, and I screwed it up so bad we we're going to have to do it again. I'm delighted to have Martin Hegwood back with us today, and he has graciously accepted my invitation to come back and redo one that I screwed up to start with, but that's that's what friends are for. And welcome, Martin. We're delighted to have you back. Well, Jim, thank you for having me back. Well, we're going to talk about some writing and some other things, and especially an award that he just got. We'll get into a little bit uh, in a little while. But first of all, I just want you to meet him, those of you who haven't. Uh, Martin's a very successful writer for published mystery novels and who just won a major award as I said we'll get into in a few minutes but I just wanted to introduce you to him and find out what his background is now you're an old boy from Pascagoula Mississippi right that's right born and raised in Pascagoula you and our fraternity brother Trent Light oh yeah lots of Sigma news from but a little later than he was yeah. <laughs> okay and from Pascagoula, I guess, to uh, to Ole Miss. Right, right. Straight to Ole Miss. I was 17 years old when I started taking classes up at Ole Miss, just almost 18. Why did you go up there to start with? Why? I don't know. Exactly. I really don't. It was just uh, it was just sort of ordained. I mean, that's that's where I was going. Um, that's Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Um, and I... From the very early age, I was just going to Ole Miss. I, I really, I, I don't know. I really never even looked anywhere else. Well, when, when you, what did you major in? Well, I majored in public administration, basically, which is a combination of political science and business, and it's about the administration of, of the government. Now, I swap majors about every semester, <laughs> so I took a little bit of everything. I mean, I literally swap majors just about every semester. I graduated. With about 154, 155 hours, which is 30 hours more than was required for an undergraduate degree, so I took went on the five-year plan. I got a smattering of everything. It was really pretty good. It was sort of uh, education by cafeteria method, but but it was a, uh, it was fine. I really, I never really had any burning desire to to be much of anything really to tell you the truth. You no, know, a writer but, was way down on your list. Oh, no. uh, a writer wasn't even there. I, yeah. I never thought I could be a writer. Well, you went to, you, yeah. but then you did go to law school, right? Yes, I did. And that was the plan the whole time was to go to law school. Now, why that is, I have no idea. It just, uh, I really never gave that much thought. Um, looking back on it, I probably should have taken a different route. I really was not temperamentally suited to be an attorney. <laughs> uh, just, it just didn't fit. I mean, I knew it from the first day of law school. Now, why in the world I went through it, I don't know. I guess just stubbornness. Well, but that kind of thing really happened, you know, was a was a boom later on when you got in some of the places where you have worked after that, right? And because of problem law school, you, you did go into law practice for a little while, didn't you? Yeah, I did, about three, three and a half years down in Pascagoula, general law practice. And that really convinced me that I didn't want to do it. <laughs> well, then how... You wound up in state government doing a whole bunch of different things. So where did you go from law school to, I mean, from uh, the law practice to? I went straight to work for the governor's office. We had a, we've got a mutual friend, John Corlew. And John, um, I needed a job. I was looking up in Jackson for a job. William Winter had just been elected governor. And John knew William Winter very well because John was in the Senate. And uh, Winter was the lieutenant governor, and he served under him. And they were good friends. And so he introduced me to him. Uh, and the next thing I knew, I was on the governor's staff. And it was sort of a, a strange situation. We didn't have sharply delineated duties. This was, everybody talks about the boys of spring. Well, I really wasn't in, in that group, although I was, I was there. And I was about the same age. We were all friends, but I was never considered one of the boys of spring. But it is true that everybody in there was at maybe 32 years old at the at the oldest. I think Marshall Bennett was the oldest one around, and he was maybe 32. Bill Cole might have been 30. The rest of us were like 
26, 27, 28 years old. Well, from there, though, you went to several other different places in state government, did you not? Yes, I did. Uh, I sort of, well, I, I took a little uh, absence, leave of absence to, to uh, do some oil and gas land work, which I loved. Should have stayed with that. But the, there was a, a downturn in the market. And uh, it turns out the only job available was in North Dakota. <laughs> and I just I just didn't want to do that. And, and then a job came up with the American Petroleum Institute in Jackson. And I took that job, stayed with them about five or six years. And that they closed that office. Um, and at that point, that's when I became the director of the Canton Redevelopment Authority. They had just started that. And then I was a lobbyist for Ole Miss for a while. Um, and then from there, I sort of, I think I had maybe one or two other jobs. And I eventually got a job with the Secretary of State's office. And I was sort of an all-purpose lawyer for the Secretary of State's office. And that was good work. I, I enjoyed that. I always felt good about it because you you really did do some good for people in, in that capacity. It, it didn't make a lot of, didn't make a lot of money, but it was, it was okay. And, uh, it was a, a chance to, to do some real good. You felt good about yourself at the end of the day. And a lot of this stuff nobody ever knew about, but, you know, it's, um, we save the taxpayer a lot of money on, on some things and, and, uh, sort of steered public policy toward, I think, the right way. It's kind of stuff that doesn't make a lot of headlines, but you felt good about it. Well, when, um, one other thing I forgot, you know, we, now we're talking about a lot of different types of jobs, but I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning for a few minutes. You, your dad actually were, had a shrimp boat at one time. Well, he did. Uh, Daddy, um, Daddy was a World War II vet, and then he came out and, and he got called back in for Korea. Thank goodness he didn't actually have to go to Korea. But after he got out, it's about 1951-52, well, I had come along. He'd, he'd gotten married. And he started following construction, as they say. He was up, he was a pipe fitter, and he did some welding and, and stuff like that. He got tired of being on the road, and he decided that Pascagoula was big enough to have two floors. They had one at the time, and uh, he decided it was big enough for two. Now, going from following construction to opening up floors is is a, a huge turnaround or a huge uh, uh, change. But he he was good at business. Daddy Daddy had a real mind for business, and he built it up into a successful operation. It got us into college and got us through college. And when the last my youngest sister got out of college, Daddy within four or five months had leased the shop out, bought a shrimp boat, and then he started going shrimping. He shrimped for about probably fifteen years or something like that. It was the best time of his life. He absolutely loved it. And did, I, I went with him a good bit. Oh, you did work on the boat. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I so, did. so we got it, Trump boat, we got Secretary of State, we got lawyers, yeah. we got uh, the, um, the oil and gas. Oil and gas, yeah. yeah. Uh, but how in the world did you finally get into writing books? Yeah, I mean, you got a diverse background. Yeah. There's no question about that. Yeah. Well, I had one of those jobs that I didn't really talk about. I was was pretty bad. I mean, I, I really didn't like that job. And uh, it was it was paying pretty well, and and I was I guess doing okay, but I I was just miserable. What was this, Mark? Mm, can't, let, let me oh, pass on that. Yeah, let me okay. pass on okay. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but anyway, it was a, a situation where. We were having a convention, this group that I was working for, and uh, we were having a convention in San Diego, California, at the Del Coronado Hotel, which is this huge wooden building. It's a beautiful hotel right on the Pacific Ocean. And I got there early. I, I made all the arrangements for the president of the group to come and, and all the, the people on the board and their wives and made the lunch, the dinner arrangements. And we were sitting at this five-star restaurant and and I was making sure that everybody's food was all right and that their hotel rooms were all right and what have you. We got through about 10 o'clock at night, you know, and everybody left. And and I just realized that I was I was just in a, a bad situation. I, I mean, it was a, I felt miserable, couldn't, couldn't stand it. So I went and got a bottle of wine at the liquor store down the street, went out to the, the beach in the Pacific Ocean, was sitting there with a bottle of wine sitting in a suit on, on the sand out there. And I was looking out of the Pacific Ocean, and I said, you know, something's wrong with this picture. I mean, this is a beautiful setting. 
I'm eating great meals and living in, I'm staying in a beautiful hotel and I'm absolutely miserable. Something's wrong with this picture. And about that time, there was that lighthouse out there in San Diego. And you've seen it at Miramar Productions. That, that it first there's this lighthouse sweeping across it. It's yeah. part of their logo. Well, that's in San Diego. And I saw that lighthouse and it just hit me. Well, you know, you've been talking about being a writer for a long, long time, but you haven't tried it because you don't have the courage to do it. It takes courage to write. People can talk about writing all day. You know, one of these days I'm going to be a writer. One of these days I'm going to do this. Well, as long as you don't actually do it, don't actually start, then you can talk about it. You know, then you can put it off. But once you start doing it, then you're you're into it. I mean, you, you've accepted the challenge. And I wasn't up to the challenge for the longest time, but I said, what do I have to lose here? You know, so I got up, walked back in the hotel room. This is about 11 o'clock at night by this time. Got some hotel stationery and a hotel pen and just started writing a story. I started out writing about a character that I thought would be good for a, 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 a novel. Just started describing the person. I wrote for about an hour or two. And then I decided, well, it took me three years to go through law school, and it was awful. Um, if I can do that for three years and get through it, I'm going to give myself three years of doing something every day to become a, a writer. And I did. Every day I started writing something and reading something about how to write. And I started reading more in the the types of books that I wanted to, to write. For about the first two weeks, it was really, really tough. I was sitting there with a blank piece of paper, and that's tough. If you never tried it, it's tough. And after a while, it got to where I'd write maybe a paragraph, maybe a sentence, maybe it was a good day, a page or two. And it was just torture. But after a while, it was kind of like starting to jog or something like that. It's real hard at first, but once you get used to it, once you get through that initial pain, then it becomes easier. And pretty soon I got to where I started looking forward to my writing time. And I started putting in a little bit more time on the weekends and things like that. And I, I developed a little bit, just by doing it, you, you develop the skill. I mean, you, you need to read a lot and you need to read about how to do it. And you need to listen to people who have done it. But you can only learn it through doing it. And after a while, it got to where I was actually looking forward to it. And if, if something happened and I had to skip a day, I felt like I had missed something. And so I worked and worked and I wrote and rewrote. And finally, after about three years, I came up with Big Easy Back Road, which was uh, my first novel. And no, I don't have that one. I don't think. I think we. But uh, Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, <laughs> but Big Easy Back Road. Uh, I like that one very much. And I was just, uh, I've got a friend who goes to New Orleans a lot. And he was just telling me that one of one of his friends down there had we had met earlier and he knew that I wrote novels some time ago. This was a New Orleanian and he went out and bought the book. He found it and bought it and he was reporting back to my friend how much he liked it. And that means a lot to me because because that guy's from New Orleans. And and if, if somebody from down there thinks it's authentic and good then then that that means a lot to you. Well, New Orleans is a background for the book, right? Yeah, I, New Orleans is a background for for all of my detect well New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf Coast. New Orleans and its orbit, I'll say that. I am writing or have written another detective novel that is set in New Orleans that I'm trying to sell right now. Uh, in fact, uh, this, this morning before I came here, I started writing a, a query letter. I've, got some, I've just started sending out the query letters for this one. It's also in New Orleans. Now, why New Orleans? It's because it's just such a good background. I mean, everybody likes New Orleans. It, it's a captivating city. It kind of tells it us. Uh, it's a story in itself, and you know, it's just you can write it about any place. People have written novels set in small towns in the country, in big cities, and uh, in little villages in foreign countries. You can you can set a, a a novel, especially a mystery novel, anywhere. But I did New Orleans simply because people who've been there are fascinated with it, and I am. I I enjoy the the story. So I'm trying to sell that one right now. Um, well, let, let me ask you this. Let's back way, way, way back, and we go back to the first one. You finished Big Easy Back Road and got an agent, right? Yes. And started, they start. how many, you had to find an agent. Tell us a story about how many times you got rejected. Yeah, yeah that's, that's about like 90, roughly um, 90 rejections. 
90 no. rejections. This is from agents, not, not from publishers. But right. Yeah. Well, yeah. that ought to tell somebody it takes some kind of perseverance. Huh? You don't just write a book, send it to an agent, get a publisher, and next day become a John Grisham, right? No, uh, you do not. And now sometimes you can get one easier if you have a, a, somebody who will introduce you or make a referral or something like that. You know, I didn't have that. I didn't know anybody who was a writer. Uh, and, uh, so, a, refer, a referral sometimes can cut through that process, but I, I didn't have that. If you're just going in cold and you don't have anybody in your corner, yeah, you can expect an awful lot of rejection. 90 rejections. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there's a book here that I, I encourage people to read about writing, but there's a book here. It's called The First Five Pages by Noah Lukeman. This is an excellent book. But he talks about the first five pages because that is so important. You're not going to get five pages. When you pick up a novel and look at it, you might read the first paragraph or two, something like that. If you haven't sort of, I won't say hooked, but at least engaged the reader by that time, you won't get him. So the first five pages are extremely important in selling the book. And what Mr. Lukeman says in, in this is that they've gotten to where they get so many manuscripts to come in and so many requests for to represent them and stuff like that, that they look for reasons, first of all, to reject you. I mean, it's it's easy. You gotta you gotta use some system. So they look at some of the obvious no nos, uh, you know, misspelling misspelling the agent's name that you're writing to, you know, uh, having a, reg a letter that says something like dear agent instead of personalizing <laughs> it, you know, or sending out something that's obviously a form. You, you got to do some study on, on these agents. You can go to the internet and find out who they represent and what type of book they represent and all this kind of stuff. Um, there are just certain no-nos, and, and he talks about this in here, that they look for a reason to reject you. It, they've, they've got to... Uh, look, there are a lot of good novels sitting in a slush pile. They'll never get there because people don't present themselves well to agents. And, and I'm not a good one to talk to about how to present yourself, obviously, with 90 rejections. But... Uh, but you just got to get through that. The publishing houses, the big ones, will not take you without an agent. They, they just won't do it. Um, they look at the agents as their first readers, as their screeners and what have you. And so the agent can approach them, but it's very, very seldom that a big publishing house will, will take anything that comes in over the transom, they say, just a, a unsolicited manuscript. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, our friend John Grisham, you know, that's that's uh, one of his experiences points out why the publishing houses won't have agents. There was a book that, that Grisham wrote, and I can't remember the name of it, this, but it was about a death row inmate. It was about a death row inmate, and I, I can't remember the name of the book right now. But it turns out that this woman in Florida had written a book about a death row inmate, and, it, and that was about the only similarity that, that, the, that the book had. Well, she sent it up to Random House or one of the whichever, whichever big publishing house, uh, Harper Collins or whoever it was that published it. She sent the manuscript up there without an agent. They rejected it, and then later on they published John Grisham's novel about a death row inmate. She sued him. She said, "You stole my idea," <laughs> you know, and and they that's one reason that that they want to use agents because anybody can send in anything from all over the world, and then you get a situation like that, they have to have some kind of a screening process, and that's one of the reasons that they use you use agents. Hmm. Hmm. And plus, they just don't want to, you know, used to, they'd hire interns, and they'd look through the slush pile and say, hey, I think this is pretty good. They don't do that anymore. Well, you can kind of understand yeah. it. You walk into a bookstore and look around. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to publish every single one of those right. books, and how many do you see? That's right. You know? Thousands and thousands. So that's there's right. got to be some kind of system to be able. Well, however, even if an agent sends in something, you've got somebody in that publishing house that says, hmm, like this or don't like that. And it's kind of up to one person a lot, of, or maybe just a small committee. Huh? Well, I tell you, the way that they do that, this book right here, and I, I might ought to send these people I'm plugging their books, you know. <laughs> I would have sent him an invoice or something. Yeah. But uh, this guy right here, Jeff Herman, who puts out every year uh, 
a guide to agents. He has a bunch of them. He'll list a hundred of them and tell you how to get in touch with them, interview them. They'll tell you what they want and all this. But he talks about that very process and he explains to the would-be writer how it works. Basically, it's, it's this. Let's say you go to a big publishing house like Random House. You've got what you call an acquiring editor. They, they've got like a dozen editors sitting around a big round table. And, and each one of these editors will take uh, submissions from agents that, that, that they know. So you've got a dozen editors and maybe they'll have three or four books each coming from, that's 36 books, coming from 36 different agents. Okay? So this person has got his three that he's, he likes, and this person's got these his three, and this one's got his three. Of course, the numbers don't work out like this, but everybody's trying to push their own particular discovery. You know, they want to get credit for, for this discovery process. And it's real tough because it's sort of a, they'll pass it around to everybody and say, this is the reason that I like this thing. And then you have to get a majority of these agents sitting, these acquiring editors uh, sitting around there to, to sign off on this thing. So there's an awful lot of reasons, a lot of places that, a lot of ways that you can falter even if you get past the initial stage and get your agent to get it to an editor. It's a, it's a tough climb now. It's, it's a hard uphill climb. Um, Looking back on it, it makes you wonder how in the world I got published to begin with. You know, I'm, I'm glad I did. But I think that my, um, my story of, of publishing and my publishing career is, is a lot more typical of, it's more like a typical writer than the big names that you hear. There are only a few big names at the top. Most people who write novels are about like me. Um, they used to call it the mid-list. You know, every once in a while, your mid-list writers will, will strike and, and hit, a, hit a big one. But uh, this business about becoming a, a superstar, it's, the, the odds are astronomically small. You just got to catch lightning in, in a bottle, really. Even the big name, the big names, if you look at some of their stories, it's incredible the amount of luck that was involved. Now, I'm not saying they're not good writers. But what I am saying is there are a lot of writers out there who are just as good who will never get up to that, that stage. It's just the, the cards just not in their favor. You know, the stars didn't line up. Uh, the famous story about Tom Clancy, about how he got into uh, propelled into stardom is, is a, a good example of just pure luck. Uh, the story is, and I, don't, I can't vouch for this, but I've heard it in different places, and I think it's something like this. Tom Clancy, of course, wrote the, the Hunt for Red October and, and, you know, all these books about submarine warfare and, and uh, it's all naval-based, naval military. And he was writing these books. Uh, he was an insurance agent up in Maryland, I think it was. And he wrote a book, The Hunt for Red October. And he got it published by the Naval Institute Press. Might have had 500 copies. And the only people who bought it are people who are interested in naval architecture. Uh, it's a very, very small universe, not many people. And they've got little presses like this that, that go to a very select little group. Ronald Reagan, president at the time, and he was going to, I can't remember the name of the battleship, but he was doing, uh, doing a tour of a battleship, and he went into the Admiral, there was an Admiral's quarters on this thing, which is a great big luxurious uh, suite within the, the battleship, and he was shaking hands with Admiral and doing all these photo ops and all this kind of stuff. And one of the writer, one of the uh, photographers suggested, said, Mr. President, why don't you act like you're doing something, you know, sign something or, or pick up a book and look like you're reading or something like that. So he reached over and picked up his book, The Hunt for Red October, one of maybe 500 copies in the world that the Admiral just happened to be reading. So he picked it up and he, he was looking at it and here was this picture, and there's Ronald Reagan reading The Hunt for Red October. And that's the picture that makes it to the New York Times. Uh, it was a front page story. It must have been a slow day for news or something. But anyway, there's Ronald Reagan holding this book, The Hunt for Red October. And the, the people in the newsroom said, hey, call over to the, the people in the book division over there and who write the reviews. Find out about this Hunt for Red October. What is it? Nobody had ever heard of it. <laughs> so they, they went and they looked at it, and they got it, 
New York Times, and they looked at it and said, man, it's pretty good, you know. And so all of a sudden they called up Clancy or called up Naval Institute Press. They said, you know, this is so-and-so from the New York Times. And, of course, they, they you know, buck up real fast. said, we were looking at your book, and we were wondering who has the rights to this, and would you, you know, would you like to, to t- talk about it or, or something, you know, uh, like to do an interview? Well, the next thing you know, the, one of the big publishing houses picks this thing up. They, they buy it from, from the Naval Institute Press. Next thing you know, it's a movie. And then he's off to the races. Now, think about the luck involved in that. It was great. It was, I'm not saying the, the, the writing wasn't luck. That, that was skill. He could have picked up any book and been looking at it. You know, He could have not been at that. That book could have not been there. They yeah. could have not been. There's so many things that had to go right. You see those stories over and over and over. Well, John Grisham is sort of, a, sort of the same type of thing, isn't it? It sort of is, yeah. I mean, and, and I wish <laughs> you'd have to get John to tell you the story. You've heard it's another thing. You know, I've heard a, a lot of different stories about how his came about. What I heard was that he had written uh, A Time to Kill, and it was with a small press, the Woodwind or Winwood Press, and, you know, it got a small run, and, and John bought a bunch of these books himself. I think he bought a 1,000 books or something. And when I say bought, I mean he actually bought them himself. See, people have got this misconception. If you write a book, they think that you got your whole dining rooms are filled up with books. They give you 20. They, they'll give you 20, and that's for family and friends and stuff like that. The rest of them, if you want them, you have to buy them just like a bookstore did. Well, John went and bought 500 or 1,000 books or something like that. And he was selling them, and, and he was in the legislature selling them out, out of his trunk. And that's a true story. And he did that. But then he wrote The Firm, and he tried to sell The Firm and didn't have any luck selling it as a, a manuscript up in New York. The story goes, and I, again, you know, he, he may call me a liar on this. I'm not lying intentionally. I'm just re- repeating this story. But it's a good story, you know. Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> so, um, his agent had a corresponding agent in Hollywood who did film stuff, and they, they would talk every once in a while. And the story is that they were on the phone, and the agent in Hollywood says, well, what you got? You know, anything interesting? He said, well, yeah, I got this book about the, the, the mob taking over a law firm. And he kind of gave him a little pitch on it. He said, well, that sounds pretty interesting. Why don't you send me the, a, a synopsis or a, a, maybe, the, maybe the manuscript but it hadn't sold. It wasn't a book. It was just a, a manuscript. And the guy in Hollywood got it. He said, man, this makes a pretty good movie. And he ran it by a couple of people in, in Hollywood. Next thing you know, they got an a option to a movie, and they got Tom Cruise in the movie. So then, they and he gets a, a big chunk of change for this, big a big amount of money. Then the agent that couldn't sell it as a book goes back to these very same people who had rejected it and says, hey, this thing's going to be a major motion picture. Would you like to look at it as a book now? He said, yeah. And so he just hit on this this little kind of, he was just in the right place at the right time. Of course, he had a good product. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't mean to, to make this sound like it's pure luck. It's sure. not pure luck. you got to put yourself in a position to be lucky. But but there was some luck involved, and there there's so many other stories like that. you got to have some, you got to have some help. It, I had helps to have friends. But the first thing you got to have is a product. You got before any of this can happen, you got to have that book out there, and you got to peddle this thing. Nobody's gonna come. I have never yet heard of a publishing house coming to your door and knocking on the door and saying, "Hey, I hear that you're writing a novel. Could you show it to me?" <laughs> yeah, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. before we get any further, I want to know what the titles of your four novels are that you've already written. Big Easy Back Roads first. Yeah. Then the Green what the Green Out Hurricane. Now that one's set in, in Biloxi. Uh, this was pre Katrina. So hold that one up so I can Yeah. The Green Out sure. Hurricane. Yeah. So this was set on the point in Biloxi pre Katrina. And uh I tried to sort of capture that little culture, the the Slavonian culture on the point that was being at the time was being sort of moved out by the Vietnamese. This was during that period of time. Okay, then the next one. The, the next book. Yeah, the, the well, let's see. That, you got that's Jack, a book. Oh, yeah, this the next one was Massacre Island. Massacre Island. And that's set yeah. on Dolphin Island, Alabama. Yeah. Oh, had a great time writing that one. It was good. And then uh, 
This one's Jackpot Bay, and it's basically in Bay St. Louis. This Jack, is the last one. Jackpot Bay. Yeah. And now, before we get out of here, we're going to have to do it pretty soon. I want to know what the deal was on this big announcement that was made last week or week before last. This has to do with a unpublished manuscript. Oh yeah, well no, it was a little bit. It was a little bit before that, but um, I had written a, a novel. It's a family saga. This is. It's not a mystery. It's not a detective story. Anything like that. It's a family saga, and by that, a family, um, well, family drama. Think in terms of like the Thorn Birds, or. Uh, uh, Dynasty or Dallas or Downton Abbey, you know, it's it's a story about a a, a family and and some generations of the family, and this one's set in Memphis, and I and I wrote it and uh took a took a long time and and it turns out it's it's I thought it was pretty good. Again, I tried to sell it, nobody nobody was interested, so I it just set it on a shelf. <clears throat> some time ago, I found out about the Faulkner, the William Faulkner Literary Competition. About 25 years ago, when Faulkner's, the anniversary of Faulkner's birth, the 100th anniversary, they decided over there in New Albany, his birthplace, to start a literary competition. And they got some people from Oxford involved, and they, they put up some, uh, I think they did, and they, they got a, the community got behind it. They raised some money, and they held the first annual William Faulkner literary competition in honor of his 100th birthday and it was a success and they decided to keep doing it and, and recently they had the 25th anniversary of the, this contest they have a novel division a short story division a play division i think a poetry division the novel division is is the biggie that's that's the big um the biggest of the groupings and it's gotten to the point where it's become international this past year, they had 355 entries in all categories from eight foreign countries and over in 40 states. So uh, it's it's got to be international in scope. They've had winners in the past that have come from London, and, and I think there was one from Wales or someplace like that. Uh, they've come from New York City and, and some of the big cities around the United States. It's just a uh, completely anonymous competition. You can't have your name on it anywhere. I've entered this under a, a pseudonym, a false name, a pen name. And I'm the first Mississippian to have won the novel division, so I'm real I'm real gratified by that. I mean I that's a I was glad of that. We need to keep this novel writing tradition up in Mississippi. But anyway, they, they got them in and, and they submitted it to some judges and this was all a blind judging uh, situation. I still don't know who the judges were. And they notified me that I had won. Uh, I figured that it had been a long time since I sent the thing off, and I hadn't heard anything at all from them. So I was, I was real, it came out of the blue. And this happened September the 22nd. Faulkner was born on September the 25th, 1897. So this was, they have it every year, this, this contest or this presentation, as close to his birth date as possible. But this was the 25th, and and I, I won it, and, and I'm real happy about that. Now, the thing about it is, it's just for unpublished manuscripts. They don't go around finding books and, and having a, a contest among published books. This is for unpublished works. Of course, the idea is maybe to get it published. Well, that's what I've got to do now. So I'm in the process right now of getting the thing ready to send it around to, to try to get it published. You have to have a synopsis, and that's tough. This thing is 80-something thousand words and try condensing that into a two-page synopsis. It's, it's hard. And then, of course, you have to um, you have to do a, a character sketch on each of the characters and, and all of this kind of stuff. It just depends on what the agents want, and then you have to find agents who want this kind of thing. Uh, family sagas are not as popular as romances or, or thrillers or, or uh, mysteries, so you know, there's a more limited field of, of people who would be taking this. And it, it is sort of a Mm. It's a literary contest. This this does have some. It it's not written in the in the vein of popular literature. It's it's more of a literary novel, so it's it's a more limited scope. But I'm gonna try to find I'm gonna try to find a publisher for it, and I've uh, got everything set up. 
to, to do that. Now, before I won this contest, I had already written another detective novel. I let that go for the longest time. I just didn't write anything for a long time. But then I got the bug and I wrote another detective novel set in New Orleans. And I was just beginning to, to peddle that one to try to get agents for that one when this Faulkner thing came along. I want to get the Faulkner deal published, but I really think I've got a better chance of getting an agent with the detective novel that I've written. So I've got two novels out there right now, and I'm trying to decide the best course of action to get them published. And I think right now what I'm going to try is to get the detective novel or get an agent for the detective novel and get that agent to handle the family saga as well. That's sort of a long shot, but I don't know any other way to do it right now. Well, uh, hopefully, you know, that, that, that'll come about. I, ho I hope I hope you can get one through this, through this video. We'll see. Uh, you never know. No, you never know. You never but, you know, you now, uh, one thing folks out there might not know, you are actually the first Mississippian to ever win this award. It's Faulkner Award, so it's kind of an interesting combination there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it, well, it... it points out a couple of things. First of all, it points out the truly international uh, nature of this competition. And they, you know, they, these novels come in from all over the world. That's the thing about it is today now, you know, with the internet, you're, uh, it's, it's globalized. I mean, your competition is all over the world. I don't know of any profession that has as much competition in it as, as writing. And, and the reason I say that is because there are no barriers to entry. I mean, you know, if you want to if you want to sell automobiles, you have to have several billion dollars to to put up an automobile manufacturing plant. You know, you you can't just jump in the business. Even if you want to have a retail business, it takes a lot of money. You've got to go out and borrow money from the bank to write. There's no barrier whatsoever. All you need is a pen and pencil well, or a yeah. laptop. So. Everybody's your com your co competition, which well, brings up another another question, and that is, if you now were to, hey, a young writer was come, a would be writer comes to Martin Higwood and said, if you were me, what would you do to, to be successful in this writing business? Well, I think the the first thing you you have to do is to you've got to read an awful lot, and and you have to determine. What you like to read? Do you like romance novels? Do you like cozy mysteries? Do you like hardball detective mysteries? Do you like thrillers? Do you like historical novels? What do you like? And you find out what you like, and you read as much as you can in that particular genre, that particular division, and you will eventually you'll develop a, a subconscious feel for what it takes, what what is good and what is bad in that particular area. Just read, read, read everything that you can get your hands on in that particular area. And while you're you're reading heavily in one particular area, you, you need to at the same time read a, a sort of a broader spectrum of literature. And don't you don't just read the good stuff. You gotta read the good stuff. But you need to read the the bad stuff uh, also. Faulkner gave this advice to to uh, to read the good stuff as long and, and as well as the trash. In my opinion, you can learn more from reading a bad novel than you can from reading a good novel. And the reason I say that is because when you read a, a novel that's really good and well written, most of the time, the author, the style is not noticed because the best style is one that you don't notice. It's one that's so smooth and, and subtle that, that you can't really pick it out. So you really don't know it's hard to put your finger on what makes a, a novel good, but if you read one that's bad, read one with some corny or cliched dialogue or, or where people don't talk with each other or, or the dialogue sounds like they're, they're giving speeches to each other or where the descriptions are overly dramatic or overly long or something like that. When, when you, you see something that's bad, that just jumps off the page at you. And remember that piece of bad writing and don't do it. So I'm, what I'm saying is you can... You can learn as much from reading a bad novel as you can from reading a good novel. So just read. Uh, the young writer needs to, to read everything that he or she can. The second thing is get some books like this. This one right here 
Self-editing for fiction writers is one of the best ever, and it's, that thing is 40, 50 years old. It's, it's probably out of print, but you can find it on the Internet. Read books about writing. They will tell you some, some of the, the pitfalls, the things to avoid. Uh, Noah Lukeman, in, in the book, The First Five Pages, says that it's, it's incredible, but people tend to make the same mistakes as, as beginning writers all over the world, <laughs> every socioeconomic class, they make the same mistakes in, as they start out their writing. And he named some of them. But you've got to do this. You've got to go through these periods. You've got to make the mistakes. You've got to get it down on, on, the, on paper. That's the second thing. After you read, and after you read about writing, then start writing. And don't worry that it's not any good. It's going to be terrible. I mean, it's like you can account on that. It's going to be bad. Everybody's first drafts are bad. Ernest Hemingway, one of the famous quotes is, all first drafts are blank. And he, I mean, they, they just are. They're crap. I mean, they're, they're bad. Um, but the thing about it is you've got to get it out of your system. It's like clearing your throat. You've got to get this stuff out. Now, later on, you can go back and you can revise. That's where good writing comes in. Don't be afraid to revise. In fact, You've got to revise. Sit down, write something every day, or at least as, as near to that as you can. Don't let it sit for, for weeks at a time and then try to come back to it. Write it all down, get it out, and get it on paper. That way you've got something to revise. That, that's that's your, your lump of clay that, that you can mold, but you've got to have that, that bad first draft down there before you have something to revise. Um, I'll get you you got to have that bad first draft before you can have something to revise. And another thing is don't talk about writing. Don't talk about your novel. And for goodness sake, don't tell everybody that you want to be a writer. Just don't. You don't need to put that pressure on yourself. Just do it. Don't, you know, don't talk about it. Do it. And don't talk about your story while you're writing it. Now, you can do that with nonfiction, but with fiction... Once it gets out of your subconscious, it's out. And you can tell it, but it's a, it's a story that's, it grows old fast. It's like that old Bob Skaggs record said, once the story's told, it can't help but grow old. And it gets more stale each time it's told. So put it down while it's fresh. Now, it may be bad, but at least the idea and the emotion is fresh, and you can revise it. Okay. Um, if you, We're going to probably get a million questions back over you know over this video and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you if possibly in the future we might get together and answer some of these questions that i know will be coming yeah absolutely okay absolutely um but we've kind of hit the end of this i've got to run over and take care of another little problem that just occurred <laughs> you know what my technical expertise is so we'll stop this session for now but I would sure like to, to reserve the right to call you back and answer some other questions if we could. I would love to talk about the process of writing. Good. Now, I, I have learned a lot about that process. No question. Uh, so, and so we appreciate your coming in here today, and hopefully we're going to get together again. Jim, Thanks, I man. think you have me. Thank Always you, enjoy. Good. Good to see you. All right.